Hello all, guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Welcome to the newest episode of the Noobs and Knockouts podcast, taped live at the Twitch and brought to you on Spotify, on Google and Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. I'm Austin. I'm a knockout. Watched a lot of wrestling. I'm David. I'm a noob. Haven't watched nearly as much wrestling. I really don't want to be here. Please I don't know what you're mercy. so unhappy about. They, well, I'm. What a perfect segue to say yeah. that because we are going. We are on the road to no mercy. Oh, to be exact, Christ I, in a hand basket. So we are here, folks. This is the start of a brand new arc on this podcast. One that I'm very excited to share with David. Unfortunately. We are going deep and one of the worst angles in the history of the WWE and home. And boy, have we had a lot of options for that. It's time for Katie Vick. I, I just, I'm remembering the last time you subjected me to a, a bad arc with the with the double undertaker one and i remember it was a slow burn of dislike for me like it started off being like this actually isn't that bad austin hyped it up to be like this is the worst shit ever um i while i would like to think the best of my dear co-host i also know he's an intelligent human who's like good at learning from his mistakes and i feel like this is not going to be a slow burn of hate and i feel like i'm gonna want to roblox myself about two minutes in um all right so I, I've I've heard nothing but bad things about the ruthless aggression era. So please tell me how much pain I'm in for. Well, I will go ahead and tell you that the thing from this angle is not this week; it's next time. But oh I feel very confident that unlike last time, where we got to the big reveal moment, you were a whole lot of whatever. I'm very confident. The moment this time is gonna piss you off. To be fair, part of the reason I was like, oh shit. Uh, part of the reason I was like, can whatever about it last time was more the fact that it was done in a really confusing way. Like, like when you promise me things I'm gonna hate, I expect a certain level of bombast and kind of the whole problem Mm -hmm. with Undertaker versus Undertaker was that it lacked that or any real sense of comp competent coherent structure at, at, at all it just kind of meandered no that's fair the way. that's fair <laughs> that, that, that won't that, be a problem this time i'm a little more familiar with how this arc plays out in what way i'm a, yeah I'm, I'm a little more knowledgeable this time i know i know that we're gonna have some bombast because it's ruthless aggression and here's here i know next to nothing about ruthless aggression oh, i just remember seeing on some wrestling memes page somebody posting like it was it was a meme image of like spongebob as wrestling eras and Mm -hmm. or it was either it was either spongebob as wrestling eras or spongebob as like kane during different wrestling eras one of the two Uh, something to that effect but it was spongebob and wrestling eras and and i saw one that's like spongebob super like buffed up and like really scary looking and it said ruthless aggression and it was like after attitude era and i'm like wait there was a time after the attitude era that like had a name and wasn't just like yes. contemporary WWE. What? Yep. All uh, right. Let's, yeah. Let's, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and explain the ruthless aggression era. The ruthless aggression era is the name colloquially given to roughly 2002, late 2001, it, to 2008. Um, it is character basically in your, the easiest way to describe it is that. It is after the Attitude Era, but before WWE went PG again. So they are currently still TV-14. And the name comes from uh, Vince McMahon gave a famous promo where he said that he's looking for this new breed of superstars. Because you need to understand that uh, at this very quickly, by 2002 even, like Stone Cold has retired due to injury and the rock is off making movies now he's he got, he got the fuck out of here yeah so yeah they're they're dis, the top guys are gone and they need and the new people need to come up to replace them mm-hmm. and vince mcmahon cuts his promo that he's looking for ruthless aggression and this even plays out on tv 
when in John Cena's very first ever match on TV, he challenges Kurt Angle, and Kurt Angle says, "What do you, what, why do you think, what do you think you got to take, what, uh, like, why are you taking me on? What do you think you got that you can beat me?" And John Cena answers him and says, "He's got ruthless aggression," tying in directly to the Vince quote. So. The ruthless aggression era, that's like now that is the time frame. And like mixed bag, I'll say it like that. Mm. Like, I think I think the easiest way to put it is that WWE, it's WWE trying the worst parts of the ruthless aggression era, and that's important for what we're doing today is WWE trying too hard to still be the edgy counterculture program that it was at the beginning of the Attitude Era. Uh, But taking it even farther. Okay. Like, there's just a lot of offensively bad storylines that come from the Ruthless Aggression Era. More so than maybe any other time in wrestling. And... It also is kind of care- defined by like the rise of wrestlers that have a bit more of a mixed reception in terms of their time at the top. You have Triple H and his reign of terror as the world champion. You have uh, John Cena kind of working his way up to the top as a wrestler, but then also becoming the kind of goody good PG guy that Vin- the WWE wanted him to be. And the fans being like, uh, nope. Mm hmm. You have the rise of Brock Lesnar, and as quickly as he rose, he quit. Yeah. In 04. Oh, man. So it's just a, it's a bit of a heck. Dave Batista, this was his rise in the Ruthless Aggression era, but he kind of never reached the same heights as he did on his first, his path to the top was never, was always the best part of his career. He never quite hit that same high quality again. Yeah, I've seen I, I that specifically. I've seen a couple clips here and there of 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 Batista in his time, and I'm mm-hmm. like, oh look, it's Drax. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, but it like every time every, the, the vibe I get from him is just that he was kind of boring character wise. Yes, like it doesn't seem like he's got a whole lot going on other than he's Batista. He just seems like. He seems like Lesnar 1.0 in a way. I do just, see that idea. Just like, just like big, scary, tough dude who's hard to beat, but doesn't really have any character traits outside of that. Yeah, that's a fair point. He, and that's why, like, the storyline that took him to the top, which I'm not going to get into because I honestly kind of want to maybe discuss that in further detail in a different arc of the show. But his story to the top was really good. And after that, it's just like, well, never quite the same. <sighs> oh. And then the era kind of ends to, to is defined also by the tragedies of that time. This is the death of Eddie Guerrero in 2005 and the Chris Benoit murders of 2007 become defining characteristics of the time period and are a big factor and not, and to be fair, not the only factor in WWE eventually dropping TV 14, going back to being TV PG and thus beginning the PG era as it is Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of details that I skip over there, but I'm just trying to hit some high points on the ruthless aggression era. Point being is that I, I think that from what you've seen, I think of it as like, a bit of a blend between like you. So we've seen a lot of good wrestling and the PG era, but the mm-hmm. same kind of like vibe and attitude that we saw in the attitude era. That was not the best. Like, am I, like regardless of quality of that, I think that in terms of show structure, that's kind of what I want you to think is going to happen tonight. Okay. Okay. That makes, that makes sense. And it's, mm-hmm. it seems along the lines for like what I've expected ever since I mm-hmm. kind of first heard of the era. Yeah. Yeah. So time to start going over. We are on the road to no mercy. The next pay-per-view um, right now we're in a hard brand split, by the way, is Raw and SmackDown. They got separate rosters. They got separate general managers 
like they this is this is early brand split so they they try to like make it be mean something in storyline like uh, the idea of a wrestler crossing over from Raw or SmackDown is like there was a trade, there was contract negotiations. It was why it was really crazy and unexpected. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And yeah, so I will go ahead and say that the people in charge of Raw and SmackDown at this point in time, uh, SmackDown is run by Stephanie McMahon right now, and Raw is currently being run by Eric Bischoff. Oh, oh, wait, what year are we in? 2002. Oh, shit. This was just after the merger. It was. Oh, my w God. After all that invasion shit, after the merger, after the invasion shit, we're going to talk a lot more about that next week, by the way. Oh, God. About the invasion. Um, all that out of the way, WWE brought in Eric Bischoff to be an on-screen authority figure. Man, that must have been and, a real slice of humble pie for Bischoff to, to sign on with the enemy. Yep. Uh, one of I don't usually give WWE credit for their power moves, but also as a power move, they hired Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff after buying out both of their companies in 2001. Wait, Paul Heyman was like a, a rival owner? I never knew that. Paul Heyman ran ECW. Oh, shit! Okay, it's all coming together. Yeah, real, real big dick energy on that. On that, that is, move. That there. is some serious mm -hmm. BDE. I'll give it to him. Mm -hmm. I'll give it to him. I mean, fuck Vince McMahon and everything he stands for. But damn, when that man has a power move, he has a power move. I can't yep. deny it. Any, so let's let's cover the storylines that we are building to and. Uh, I've watched two episodes of Raw since they're the as they has had recently had a pay per view. Now we're on the road to the next one. So uh, at Unforgiven 2002, Triple H he is the World Heavyweight Champion. He's the first, and I believe he is at this point. Like I believe he is in that first reign as the champion. Basically, uh, Brock Lesnar was the undisputed WWE Champion, and then in storyline, Stephanie signed him exclusively to SmackDown. So, and Eric Bischoff was like, what the fuck? Now I have no world champion. Yeah. So I'm going to just make one up. The world heavyweight title. It looks like the big gold belt from WCW is the, is the, is the aesthetic here. Oh, and, he, and, he, and he gives it to Triple H because Triple H was the number one contender when Brock Lesnar was signed to SmackDown. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I can I can get on board with that. Yeah, so he is the world champion right now. He on P. I just had a pay per view match with Rob Van Dam, who is both one of the most innovative uh, high flying wrestlers of the 1990s for ECW, and is also a major stoner, bro. Oh wait, this Isn't guy? He? Yeah, bro, Yay! Rob Van Dam. So he had a pay per view match with Triple H, and Triple H won with the help of Ric Flair. After oh, Ric Flair oh, was oh. taken out of power as being one of the co-owners of WWF after we ended that storyline. <laughs> the consortium was me. Was me. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk more about that next week. Yay. We get to do, I finally get to do the consortium meme. Yes. The consortium was, was Ric Flair. Anyway, Ric Flair, he took time off TV and he's re-debuting. He's now Triple H's manager. Like Rick Flair came on TV and was like, you know what? Triple H reminded me that I'm that I, I've, I've become I've grown soft and weak as I've gotten older. And Triple H helped me find my edge again. And so now he's basically gonna for the next few years of time, he's gonna be Triple H's best lackey, the man to oh, make sure shit. the belt stays around Triple H's waist. Sounds about right. The OG Supreme Motherfucker parenting the Supreme Motherfucker 2.0. Yeah, yeah, on brand. And he's had a bit of a two-week feud with Bubba Ray Dudley, another ECW legend. Uh, dude, Bubba Ray Dudley, he puts people through tables. I mean, yes, this is this is yep. wrestling. Yes. I didn't realize you could do that as like a shtick. I just kind of thought everyone did that. Hey, um, but he is. He kind of cuts this great promo in the lead up to a match with Triple H talking about like he makes himself out as like the every man who's who has to fight and scratch for his opportunities. He, he this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for him. He's not some he's not like Triple H who who is gifted opportunities all the time. He's 
he's worked hard for this, and this is his one shot, and then he loses. Ah! <laughs> so um, Triple H. Fortunate. So Triple H is the world champion, and he needs a tag, and he needs a match at the pay per view, leading into Kane's storyline right now. Uh, Kane is right now, honestly, on a quest for gold. Okay. Uh, uh, two week, two episodes ago on the September 23rd episode of Monday Night Raw. We're, tonight we're going to watch the October 7th episode, by the way. Um, on the September 23rd episode, uh, Eric Bischoff puts uh, Kane in a tag team title match against the Un-Americans. I'll explain more about them in a sec. Okay. Uh, and he, Kane will have a mystery partner. His mystery partner is The Hurricane. Uh, the Hurricane is a superhero parody comedy character played by Gregory Helms. He has this bright green outfit, and he okay. does like and he does like funny superhero poses. He even has an alter ego like Clark Kent. He Clark Kent's it sometimes. So Bray Wyatt before Bray before like before Bray Wyatt. <laughs> How's he? How's that? How do you? Bray well, because because the fiend because the fiend has like the Bray Wyatt alter ego. I don't know. I think it's a different. It's a bit of a different kind of alter ego, but you know. That's fair. That's see fair. the comparison. Uh, so, and I feel like they put this tag team together solely because their tag team name is Hurricane. Oh Christ! Anyway, wait, 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 wait. WWF is trying to be the. Uh, can, can, trying to continue to be the ultimate edge lords of the industry, and yet put together a tag team with the pun name Hurricane. Listen, really, w, Vince McMahon's desire for corny wrestling never stops breaking through. Sometimes, <laughs> I don't understand Vince's deep power for Tona Whiplash. It do, it does not. I don't understand how he's so adept at that quality yeah. anywho kane went and hurricane win the tag team titles he he kane makes out with terry runnels the in the backstage interviewer it's all good uh, kane never struck me as the kissy type i, I don't I, worry I... he is now he's had so many storylines where he gets a girlfriend multiple storylines damn you know i can't I, I can't be too mad or weirded out by that because my favorite Kane thing ever is where he gets a boyfriend in the form of Brian da uh, Daniel Bryan. So, hey, fair. You know? uh, he even has a he even has the line in one of these last two episodes where he's like, "Chicks dig the mask." Vince, <laughs> how how do you reconcile these things, Vin Vincent? V Vince, may, may, may I call you? May I call you Vince? Uh, I, I just I, I need to I need you to understand y you have a character who uh, when uh, upon his premiere upon his debut and for the his early days his whole thing was that he was legitimately quite scary re re rather intimidating I, I I am intimidated by early days Kane dude 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 dude's dude's freaky and was good at being kind of fucking terrifying. And you're in the era, the ruthless aggression era, wherein you're trying to go even harder on the whole we're edgy and cool and whatever thing. And instead of going the route of making the easiest, uh, easily scariest part of your roster even scarier, tr trying to do horrifying, brutal things with him to, 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 to really, like, add an edge to your show, you're... you're you're having him turn to the camera and say, and I and I quote this, Vince, v Vincent, sir, uh, chicks dig the mask. Uh, yeah, listen. Uh, what? Kane, listen. A lot of people understand that Kane as a character has had uh, suffered a lot of tonal whiplash. He, ha think? he has gone back and forth between being a big scary monster and a big goofy dude so many times in his career that there are people who believe that he can no longer fulfill either role correctly. Well, I mean, to be <laughs> fair, he's in corporate now, so that's a whole different yeah. kind of whipple. Uh, it, it, it kills me. It's, it absolutely murders me 
to this day that Kane became part of middle management. And and they still act like he's the same dude. And yep, just never acknowledge the fact that he was once this supernatural fire controller. Oh no, they do. They acknowledge that the, he's got the he's the same dude in the big scary mask, and he puts the big scary mask on. He's a real big scary dude, but you know, right now he's not wearing the mask, so he's this middle manager. Kane, okay, anyway, how's it going? Uh, but there's a time where he is both big scary dude and not wearing the mask. Don't think about this too hard, all right? Uh, but, but I I don't get it. I just uh, like I I know I get I get that we have to have Kane in corporate offices, but you could you couldn't have done anything else. You uh, oh man, I love Kane. I love Kane, and my favorite mm-hmm. Kane time is Kane at his goofiest. You you listeners, dear listeners, you've mm-hmm. heard me rave about how much I love Goofy Kane. Uh, 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 why why do we keep doing this to him? It doesn't make sense. Anyway, back to <laughs> Kane's quest for back to on topic. Kane is he's the tag team champion. And then on the October 30th, on the September 30th episode of Raw, Eric Bischoff announces that on pay-per-view for Unforgiven, it is going to be the world heavyweight champion, Triple H, against the Intercontinental champion. Title for title. There will be only one tie champion on Raw by the time we're done here. And so the big storyline of the September 30th episode is who's going to be the Intercontinental champion. Will it ah. be the current champion, Chris Jericho? Oh shit, buddy! Who is currently in his King of the World shtick, which is him just being an obnoxious blowhard. And also, this is when Fozzie was first getting started, so he's calling himself a big rock star, and everybody else is like makes fun of Fozzie for being shit. Uh, so, so normal business then. Bus- business yes. as usual. <laughs> yeah. So will it be Chris Jericho or will it be Kane? And in the main event, uh, Jericho loses to Kane, despite the fact that he tried to cut a deal with Triple H to get him to help him win the match so mm-hmm. that it could be Jericho versus Triple H on pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. And Triple H tried to cheat to help Jericho, but it failed. So Kane is now the Intercontinental Champion as well. He is the tag ch- half of the tag champs. He's the Intercontinental Champion, and now he's in line to fight for the world title. Oh wait, is this when he's tag teaming with? Uh, oh no, Hurricane. no, oh yeah. Hurricane. Yeah, I just sorry, about that. I, I, you, you, you did, but I heard, I hear Kane and tag team. Like, oh, Undertaker. He's had a ton. He's been in a ton of tag teams, actually. Oh, wow. Anyway, so then the next th- uh, kind of. Uh, leading on to what Y2J is up to, because this is this is currently a time when a lot of writing, there's a lot of interweaving storylines and wrestlers interacting in different storylines with different characters. An absolutely insane concept that Dota B will not, in fact, use today. <clears throat> anyway, so Y2J, outside of this intercontinental title business that he's now lost, he has also run into, the, run into Booker T and Goldust. Who are currently a tag team? Oh, there, okay. It's a bit of it's an odd couple tag team kind of a bit. Okay, okay, I'm 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 here for it in that it gives Goldust some level of dignity by association. They're like forced to treat him with some level of respect. Okay, mm-hmm. okay, I can live with this. Yeah. So uh, at the pay per view, Eric Bischoff decided to try to humiliate Stephanie McMahon by having her get stink faced by Rakishi. So Rikishi is a comedy character whose shtick is, is that he is a big fat man with a big fat ass. And he likes to stick his big fat ass in people's faces. (laughs) And Eric Bischoff done tried to do this to Stephanie, except... All of his wrestlers on all of the wrestlers on Raw hate Eric Bischoff, so they all conspired to stop this, and they made it. So oopsie doopsie, Eric Bischoff is the one who gets an ass, a face full of ass. <laughs> is it too late to quit the podcast? I don't want to yes. do this anymore. Yes. <laughs> so after. <laughs> Uh, look, so I get after- it. I, I get it. During during 
uh, uh, Attitude Era, we had Stone Cold shoving his ass in McMahon's face, and it was popular, and everyone loved it. But that doesn't mean we need a reprise with uh, with a guy whose whole shtick is huge ass. And again, I really need to emphasize this: mm-hmm. the ruthless aggression era. Somebody, please make sense of this. Yes. So Booker T and Goldust after the pay per view make fun of Eric Bischoff in front of the whole locker room about how this happened. And so Eric Bischoff hears about it from one of his goons. I'll talk more about the goons later. And so Eric Bischoff currently has a bit of a, has a bit of a grudge against Booker T and Goldust. And he put Goldust in a match with Jericho. Uh, Jericho beat Goldust. And now he is in the cross way. He's in the crosshairs of his tag team partner, Booker T sucker. Booker T's character is the exact same as it was when he was in Harlem Heat, but now he's a baby face. But he's otherwise doing like, all his same mannerisms. I feel like Booker T's character has just always been the same. It had except for when he was the king, King Booker. Yeah, oh, he's yeah. pretty much always done the same character. Yeah, <laughs> yes. fair enough. So right now, Jericho and Booker T are beefing, and uh, that'll certainly pay a part in the pay per view coming up. Now we now to get to to, to to rewind as I mentioned the Un-Americans were the tag team champions. Who are the Un-Americans? You might ask. The Un-Americans are Christian, uh, uh, Lance Storm, William Regal, and Test. They are they are exactly what you think they are by the name of the team. They are three Canadians and a British man talking shit about America. Of course, of course, the number one way to get heat is just say Murica bad and everyone hates you. Yeah. Yes. But right now, they are going through some hard times. After Jericho, uh, not Jericho, Christian and Lance Storm were the tag champs, and then they lost them to the Hurricane. And ever since then, they have been at each other's throats and comically losing tag team matches due to miscommunications, malfunctions at the junction. They're fighting with each other. It's not a good time right now in un-America land. Yeah, okay. Well, rip them, I suppose. Yep, rip them indeed. Finally, let's talk about the women. Because I'm sure David is really going to enjoy this segment of the show. Hey, hey, I the last time we we talked women was the climax of women's revolution, and that was super dignified. And I'm sure we're going to get more of that, right? No. Oh, this is ruthless aggression, baby. <laughs> Oh, well, it was fun while it lasted. Right. So right now, the women's champion is Trish Stratus. Uh, she is hot and blonde and a baby face. I, I almost hate to like, di- like call, like boil her character down to just that because she's actually a really talented performer and is one of the most beloved women from this era of time. But also her character was that she was hot. What do you like? Yeah, well, that's also like a majority of woman characters for a yeah, lot I'm of the actually, time. Yes, I'm actually having a very difficult time telling, giving you any distinct characteristics between these women that I'm going to mention in the next couple of minutes. Well, that's great. So Trish Stratus is the women's champion. She's been a, she's been wrestling matches all the time, uh, constantly at this point. After her pay per view match on Raw, she had a triple threat match between uh, against Victoria and Molly Holly, uh, two women whose characters are they are women. Yeah. Okay. And then on the September 30th episode, she is scheduled to have a match with Victoria again, and <laughs> Victoria beats. Trish's ass in the back in, the, in a backstage assault before her match, and then they get to the match, and then they're having the match, and eventually Victoria says, "Fuck it, I'm gonna hit Trish Stratus in the face with a steel chair," and that's a DQ, sir, yeah. ma'am. That is a DQ. So you have lost your chance at the title, and it is played vaguely like she's crazy, and I think that's Victoria's character archetype for a while but i don't really know enough about this era of time to say that for sure but it's basically tried to play it off as like she's just so she just wants to beat trish stratus up so badly she can she can't contain her rage 
the WWF Women's Division starring in Bitches Be Crazy. Indeed. Also, backstage in the build-up to this, to hype up this week's episode, which is taking place in Vegas, which means it's the very first ever Raw Roulette episode. Oh, very hey, exciting. we've done one of those. We did. That was the this time I'll finally get to learn what the fuck a song and dance match is. Hopefully, that sounds fun. Uh, anyway, uh, so Eric, that means not gonna happen. Anyway, Eric Bischoff is backstage, kind of like basking in this wheel that has his face on it. <laughs> <laughs> next, this is the wheel for next week, and Stacy Keebler shows up. She is yet another women woman on this roster who is hot, and that's about it. Mm-hmm. And she has come up to Eric and is like, listen, Eric, Mr. Bischoff, I need more time on TV because I am, and this is this is a quote, is that I am going against Trish Stratus in the semifinals for the Internet Babe of the Year Award. Not kidding. That's what she said. It's a WWE.com thing, I assume. And she needs an opportunity to... To get more TV time because she's the because Trish is the women's champion, so all the people are voting for her because she's on TV all the time. And Eric Bischoff is like, you know what? Yes, uh, we'll do this next week and we'll spin the wheel. And he teases us with some of the match types that could be this week. For example, this match, Stacy versus Trish, could be a kiss my ass match where the loser must kiss the ass of the winner or. It could be an HLA match. And I'm very unhappy to have to explain this term to you, David. I really Uh am. So there was an episode of Raw where Eric Bischoff was the GM. And it was built around HLA, also known as Hot Lesbian Action. Eric Bischoff promised the audience, that the, the two women were going to get in this ring and they were going to have sex on air. And then they don't. Then Eric Bischoff, they, they go in front of the ring, they lightly make out with all the enthusiasm of two women who are forced to do porn in front of a live audience. And then Eric Bischoff sends out his two goons to beat up the women. And even though this rare, even though the actual HLA segments don't happen very often on these shows, it is ubiquitous with Eric Bischoff's tenure as general manager. Is HLA hot lesbian action? You're going to see a ton of signs from people in the crowd being like, "I love HLA." What the fuck? So many layers. What the fuck? What? you know i one thing it's it's different i i i i i understand why hla is a thing of of this time but i still can't fully wrap my head around the fact that wwf was de- was debasing itself to this level of of yeah we're gonna just tease lesbian porn to the to the audience for kicks and views the, 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 they actually went there uh, and it's i'm sure deeply disgusting but they actually they actually went there I, that's not a low that even i even previously considered that that they could stoop to but they did and that the company that did that is still around i i i i i I feel i feel dirty i feel numb i don't i don't i can't i i think i'm broke i think this just broke we haven't even watched the damn episode and i think i'm already fucking broken oh god man i'm excited to talk to you very soon about billy and chuck please no (laughs) Anyway, so that covers storylines that I know are going to pay off at the pay-per-view. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw out this one that's only been on TV so far. It's Tommy Dreamer, uh, who is ECW legend. <clears throat> that is his shtick, is that he is hardcore, sir. I've and 
And Chris Nowinski, his thing is he's a Harvard graduate. Valid. And he is exactly the kind of dude bro asshole that you expect from a Harvard graduate. Valid. And they've been having a fight. They've been having the fights. They did a whole bit where Chris uh, Nowinski set up an entire like college classroom for Tommy Dreamer to show up in backstage. I don't get the logistics of this, but then they fight. They brawl throughout the classroom. It was kind of sweet. Wait, wasn't it? No, Tommy Dreamer, you said it was from ECW, right? Yes. Where have I heard that name before? Dark Side of the Ring. He's the guy who defended Ric Flair. Oh, oh, no. That guy, yes. Oh, you know, right when I thought there was a storyline here that was just bland and inoffensive, it has that motherfucker. Okay, cool. Great. <laughs> All right, last thing is that uh, is Eric Bischoff shtick as GM besides the HLA thing. There is one more part about his GM thing that you should know about. Okay. Is that his goons, uh, Rosie and Jamal, who are three-minute warning. Uh, they're just these two do beefy dudes who beat up people at Eric Bischoff's behest. And basically, they're called three-minute warning because when he first uh, – he when he first – debuted them it was he basically was he basically like he said eric bischoff set up a match and after three minutes eric bischoff got bored and he sent rosie and jamal to go kick their asses so they are now known as three minute warning and you will eric bischoff what he'll do is he will ham-fistedly make a mention to the phrase three minutes and when he does that rosie and jamal descend like they're like batman or something answering the bat signal Rice. Okay, sure. Why? Why not? Makes a lot of sense. And their manager is Rico. Rico was the gay hairdresser of Billy and Chuck. And after that storyline devolved into garbage, he's now just a dude. But you might hear the crowd might chant "Rico's gay" at him in a negative context. So you know, prepping you for that one. He it Thank happened. You. It happened on the September thirtieth episode, and that's, that's why I feel like I have to mention. <laughs> he doesn't you. he doesn't play camp gay or anything it's just he used to be camp gay in a storyline and the crowd is happy to remind him oh man that is depressing yep as you can see david we have a lot of fine storylines to cover on this episode today when Ruthless Aggression sends its storylines, they're not sending their best. Definitely not when I'm picking these arcs, no. Uh, <laughs> okay, 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 I'm strapped in, I guess. Yep, so if you guys want to watch the October 7th, 2002 episode of Raw along with us, you can do so at Peacock TV. Dot com. It is WWE's streaming American streaming partner for four nine nine a month with ads, nine 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 a month without ads, and of course, if you're outside the U.S., the WWE Network is still nine dot nine ninety nine American. But let's go, new arc, first ever arc in the ruthless aggression era. Kill me. And we are back. We have just finished the October 7th, 2002 episode of Monday Night Raw. The very first ever Raw roulette. You know, I I can reserve a, ti a ti ti tiny bit of my rage. Because I'll, I'll give this episode this on a broad level. Some of the in-ring work wasn't the most offensive I've ever seen. It was actually, like, pretty decent, some of the stuff. I'll give it that the work sometimes was good, and that, like, helped balance out my anger a little bit. But, oh boy, I did still can see the writing on the wall for a lot of ways this is going to go dumb, and there were a lot of things that really did get under my skin. Uh, uh yeah this was this was perfect i could have started with the with the thing that's next time but this is a good introduction to what it's the a warm up. era is it's a warm-up because like. i didn't hate every single second 
there were some mm-hmm. times where I was like, this is actually pretty okay. Yeah. So I think we should just go in order. I uh, yeah. Um so Jerry Lawler's back. Didn't miss him. Uh no, he he's got a whole thing to do today. He's got a whole th- you know, I it was really funny when we started this cuz like, you know, I, I'm me and as as I've done many a time on this podcast, I I cuz I started off I started off this podcast a very different man than I am currently in a lot of ways. I mean, I've become a wrestling fan. I'm a lot more in tune with the culture and thus my tastes have changed and my perspective on things have shifted. And when we got to the opening and I'm like, Lawler's back, God damn it. And I slipped into my old, like hating Lawler meme. I did have a moment of stopping internally and being like, you know, maybe I exaggerate a little bit. My distaste for Jerry Lawler, like, like, yeah, he's obnoxious, but that's kind of the point of his character in a lot of ways. And I didn't even, like, hate him during the Muppets episode, because he was rooting for the Muppets, and that was cute mm-hmm. and charming. May- maybe I give Lawler a bad rap. Maybe I should start to tone this down. And then, oh boy, I ate those words real quick. And I feel absolutely no need for any further self-reflection on this. No, absolutely fuck Jerry Lawler, and we'll get into why as we go on. So, yep, didn't yep. miss him. So we open the show with some stock footage from Las Vegas that will appear throughout the rest of the episode. At Austin Commercial was Bridge. a huge fan. Was a huge fan of the the, Austin, the the Las Vegas stock footage. So why why, why 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 did that get you so hard, buddy? Because you were you were you were in for a penny and for a pound every single time it, it popped just, up. Just I just really like this fake very stock footage of Las Vegas. Like you could have convinced me that they weren't even in Vegas tonight. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. And, and also they had like the stockiest, stockiest ass music behind it too. Mm-hmm. It's just, the, yep. it was generic. So we start, we start off uh, with Eric Bischoff is at his wheel hmm. with, with his big old wheel. It's unfortunately they took his face off the middle of it. Yeah. I was surprised by that. And he's got two Vegas showgirls at his side who do nothing the entire show. Yep. And so he just talks up this event and he spins the wheel for the first time tonight. He shows off some of the, the match types like Bischoff's choice an HLA match. What does that mean? I don't think we'll ever know. You know, I, there were some that I was surprised didn't get used. Some I was surprised in some case, stupidly that it did get used and some that when they did get used were not, Fully what I expected them to be. So yeah, I'll give it this: the roulette wheel sure kept me on the edge of my seat. I guess. True. Anyway, the first thing it lands on is a steel cage match. Very yeah. convenient because they already had it set up in the ring. Ah, uh, well, you know, I, I I I do have to shout out like early on. Fucking Bischoff gives some wimpy ass spins to this wheel. Like he does, he just does a little like, eh, pushes it down a little bit, and it just. It, you can tell the moment where, like, the motor on it kicks in to get it to where it actually needs to go. Yeah. It, like, it, it spins a tiny bit and it starts to slow down. And then it just suddenly, like, randomly picks back up speed a little bit. And you're like, huh. <laughs> yeah, it's an absolute shocking develop, a shocking revelation to say, but the wheel is fixed. You know, I can't believe the very first time, the, the first roulette episode we watched i thought there was a chance that maybe the wheel was legit it would be really dope if one of these days they actually did a roulette show where the wheel was legit and they actually left shit up to chance Mm. i would love that that'd be fun but that's not this so the first match is a steel cage match between booker t and Will yeah, wait, I was actually, I, I, show. if I'm talking about how far I've come, I was very proud of myself. I knew Big Show's theme from The Singer, even though I haven't, like, technically seen a whole lot of him in ring. Mm-hmm. So I felt very proud of that. I heard, Way! and I, I started singing along, and I'm like, oh, it's Big Show. And that felt nice. And it's, it's still Big Show with hair. We still, he, significantly less hair than when he was the giant faced off against Hulk Hogan at, at Hogwild, but it's Big Show with hair. That's wild to see. Yep. Uh, gets this match with Booker T. 
Uh, it's I believe they make mention to comment on commentary. This is still all part of uh, Eric Bischoff's plan to get back at Booker T for making fun of him for the stink face thing that I mentioned sure. in the first half. Uh, match is fine. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of stu- a lot of idiot balls. Yeah, kicked yeah. Up in this match, the, the bad strategy all around. Both Booker T and Big Show just swallowed the fuck out of some stupid pills before they went out. Because uh, off the bat, Booker T gets like a few opening shots in in, in on Big Show, and immediately he's like, "Yeah, it's fine. I'll try to climb the cage." Wh- why? That just puts you on the back foot, you idiot. He's not remotely down. He's gonna take a cheap shot at you, and you know it. And surprise, surprise. Big Show takes a cheap shot at him, and Booker T's on the back foot for quite a few minutes afterwards. Yeah, but don't worry. Big Show also acts stupid because he multiple times walks over to the door, which, by the way, that's to be clear. This is one of those cage matches where you don't have to climb out of the cage. You can also just exit through the door. Yeah, it's such a weird... Oh, whatever. But he, he goes over to the door. And he's like, and then Big Show's like, nah, I'm going to keep beating him up. And he does that multiple times. You could say he want, he wanted to make a big show out of it. Ah. Bah, 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 bah. Ah. Yeah, so so he dutes himself, too, by just having multiple chances to win and just being like, yeah, but what if I didn't, though? But what if I didn't just win the match? How and- about I don't anyway yeah so we have this long segment of him just beating up big booker t but booker t fights back um though we do get some gnarly like throw booker t into the side of the cage bits i'll say that much mm-hmm. big show oh, in yeah. control oh yeah i mean it's fun to watch big show throw people around sure mm-hmm. Eventually, Booker T is able to use the back Big Show into the cage wall, and that kind of gives him a chance to get an upper hand. He ends up doing his uh, spin, ki- his not a spin kick, his axe kick mm-hmm. uh, to Big Show, and then he goes over. He gets onto the top rope and then hits another kick, axe kick, but this time from the top rope. Yeah, yeah, it's good show. I mean, of course, they're both mm. fucking talented. Yeah. But event and then eventually, uh, you know, it'd be, uh, Booker T climbs the cage wall, and he climbs up and over, and he wins the match. Yes, and it seems all well and good, and then Jericho shows up, and, and then Chris Jericho like, shows up. Fuck you, Booker. Yeah, he is. Hold this whole Chris Jericho beats down Booker T. He throws him into the cage wall, like cage, like pole that mm-hmm. keeps the cage upright and Booker T takes a nice tip at a time to do some blading and yep. cut his forehead open while uh, Jericho rips up the uh, ringside yeah. uh, guardrail. That must've been fucking annoying for the yeah. ringside attendants. Yeah. So Jericho just keeps beating down Booker T. Booker T's bleeding because Jericho keeps yelling, who I'm not a sucker. <laughs> Yeah, he, I don't I didn't, know. I didn't. I didn't mention it in the front half, but like part of the whole bit from the last week was that that Booker T tried to do his catchphrase on Chris Jericho. Now, can you dig that sucker? But then Chris Jericho stops B- Booker T before he says sucker, and then later in the show, as Jericho is walking to his match, Booker T just runs up to him and yells sucker. As if he needed to finish it. <laughs> Man, Jericho really didn't take kindly to that. Also, shout out to Jericho wearing a Fozzie shirt. Just shameless self-promotion in the days of the band's infancy. Yes, it has Fozzie on the front and on the back. It says, we are huge rock stars. Yes. Fozzie right, almost well. feels more like a fake band that they made up for the Chris Jericho character at this point in time. It really does. It's really funny just how blatant it is. And he looks like such a dork wearing it. I love mm-hmm. it. Yep. So Jericho gets his gets his gets his on that one. He, he just keeps yelling like, yeah, yeah, who's bad? Hey, I'm not a sucker. 
I, I was really wondering why is Chris Jericho saying sucker like the black way and because I don't he's, know because, if it makes it okay but at least it makes it make some sense he's, yeah he's saying it the way Booker T says it yeah sure fine though I, when he does have the backstage interview later he does say sucker ah uh, the the uh, in this case the hard R is acceptable I'm terribly sorry okay <laughs> Oh, oh man! If we had any listeners, I'd be I'd be canceled for that one. Anyway, don't worry, nobody listens to this show. Nobody listens to this damn show. We can say whatever we want. Yeah. <laughs> and- Any- anyway, <laughs> after that, we get a segment with Eric Bischoff where he talks to Hurricane. Also, like, can I shout out? Bischoff being the fucking definition of smarm. Like, I, it, it's so wild just because, because I was aware of him in the early WCW days with the takeover angle, and he was just fine, upstanding, straightforward dude. And now he's like this, this smarmy asshole. Right. Just, it just, oh he's so insufferable it's so fun it's such a 180 from what i'm used to with him and he fits mm. the, he fits the type very well considering the how what a good guy he was last time i saw him which was cool i guess to see he has range but oh man yep. well uh bischoff tries to uh explain how kane and hurricane are they really fit the theme of vegas and they, oh i forgot to mention from this opening bit where he promises in order Sex, sin, lust, greed, and danger on this episode. And you I don't know, think he fulfilled that promise, actually. He really didn't uh, all that much. I mean, the the lust was definitely covered, I suppose. There was screen. no sex on this show. Well, not, not on screen anyway. And I think uh, that's for the better. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was pleasantly surprised at the lack of hla in this and where was the sin i mean to be fair wrath is a deadly sin i feel like that's just all of wrestling straight up so and greed i mean he tried to play that into kane but i don't think that works that works no no not really no and danger of course but anyway he 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 it talks about how Kane has got two titles now. He's going for three. And he says that that shows that Kane has greed. I, again, don't really buy that one. Especially because he, he just keeps being given these title masses. It's not like Kane is going yeah. out of his way to ask for it. Also, like, it's very rich to, to hear Eric Bischoff bitch at somebody else about being greedy, but okay. Yeah. Anyway, he spins the wheel and it lands on tables, ladders, and chairs. Yeah. Only the fourth ever TLC match in WWE at this point, and it will happen tonight on Raw in yeah, a four-way. Yeah, a little bit of trivia. Yeah, in a four-way tag team title match. Oh shit, buddy! Then uh, we get backstage. We get Chris Jericho in her, and she is, he is interviewed by Terry Runnels. Wait, didn't and- we also have the the Triple H wheel spin? That uh, comes after this. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the backstage interview with Terry Runnels, and she's like, what was that? <laughs> and Chris Jericho he calls her an ass clown, as he is wont to do in this era of time, is calling everybody an ass clown. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> oh, Why? And he just goes over his grievances with Booker T and how Booker T calling him a sucker cost him his title match, his intercontinental title match with Kane last week and how he is not a sucker. He is a big deal. He is is the king of the world. He is a rock star. Yeah. Yeah. Look, maybe this is an observation I should save for the end, but the the ass clown thing just really cement. I mean, everything else, but... But the ass clown thing, I guess, just reminded me of just already I'm seeing I from the moment I heard about it, I had this image in my mind of Ruthless Aggression being just grim dark. It, that that its whole MO would be like grim dark, like it's the WWE on the brink of insanity. 
and everything is just really, really fucked up. But instead, its MO just seems to be be as body as shit as humanly possible. Yeah, it's it's more um I'll put it immature. Yeah. It's really disappointing of the grim that, darky. The it's yeah, juvenile. That's the word. It's it's so juvenile. I did not expect something called the ruthless aggression era to be so fucking puerile. Oh, God, oh man! It just took my least favorite element of the of of the Edge era and blew it up to an eleven. Please kill me. Anyway, good times. Uh, then the next, we have another bit with Eric Bischoff. This time he's spinning the wheel with Triple H there, and yeah. he spins the wheel and it lands on a blindfold match. And of course, Triple H is like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Blindfold match." I hope it's one was with one of them pointing at the showgirls. Yeah, the poor showgirls keep getting macked on the whole fucking time because of course they do. And so. He Triple H is throwing up, throwing a pissy fit, and then Ric Flair comes in. He's like, "Whoa, whoa calm down there, game." And then he, and then Eric Bischoff, uh, excuse me, Ric Flair offers two fine, I assume, prostitutes, uh, to old Eric Bischoff, and he says they're gonna have some fun in that hotel room later. And it's the we we they they start like grabbing at each other, and it's like we're it's like it's a hint of HLA time. And the crowd starts cheering, and then Ric Flair's like, "Oh, whoa, and, whoa, and, whoa, and Jerry whoa. Lawler, you can even hear like, <laughs> <cut away from." laughs> yeah, Jerry Lawler. The sounds he made on this episode are just burned into my mind. Yeah, I, you've, I don't think you've ever seen like flanderized perv Jerry Lawler, but this is I've seen these, perv these Jerry sound, Lawler. But like the noises he may he makes, I'm very used to that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, like he, him, him just going, him just going, ah, ah, I, puppies. <laughs> oh God, puppies, it's, it's, Jr. Jerry, Jerry Lawler. You know what Jerry Lawler feels like to me? He feels like he fe- he feels like uh, fuck, what's his name? Uh, the the the. Di- the director of of '90s Batman. His name's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, um, '90s Batman. Um, yeah, Schumacher. Uh, Schumacher. Yeah, thank you, Joel Schumacher. He, he feels like Joel Schumacher's Two Face. In that, when he started out, he was kind of this one whole person that had two sides to his personality. There was a side that was horny as shit, <laughs> and a side. That was corny as shit. And then, as the years went on, those two sides came out at different points. So, Attitude Era rolls around, and it was, like, kind of horny. Like, it it started to... The scale started to tip tip more into into horny Jerry Lawler. And I guess now in Ruthless Aggression, we're, like, fully there. Like you said, Flanderize. It's It's just beyond parody of itself at this point. And then... Then it reaches PG era and we're at corny Jerry Lawler, mm. and it, and it's it just feels like the 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 two face of the Schumacher era where one side is like super wholesome and conservative and the other just wants to fulfill his base instincts and fuck his prostitute girlfriend with the with the bodice that whatever i think i need uh, to re-see i think i need to re-watch joel schumacher's batman soon you know i side tangent i watched a video essay a few weeks ago that made me feel very justified in my like initial enjoyment of batman forever as legitimately kind of good uh and it makes me want to revisit it because i do legitimately enjoy that movie and a bunch of people and, and like the whole world gaslit me into thinking it was bad so fuck all of you anyway <laughs> Anyway, Any, as we were saying, Ric Flair, he offers Bischoff the girls, but he shoes them off before they start making out or something. Yeah. And then Reg, uh, William Regal comes in and yep. he's like, hey, I want to match Ryan. Come on. What do you do? And he, he, he like, it's like, look at all this, this gimmicky bullshit. Yeah. He's like, what the fuck, Bischoff? 
give me a regular wrestling match, please. And Bischoff is like, no, I'm going to spin this wheel. <laughs> so he spins the wheel. And at some point, Goldust showed up in the picture. I don't know. Yeah, uh, Goldust is just there being creepy to people for some reason. Mm-hmm. I guess. I mean, that's that's Goldust. And he, so he spins the wheel, and it lands on the Las Vegas Showgirls match. Mm-hmm. And at first, William Regal's like, oh, 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 does that mean uh, I'll be having one a match with one of these fine ladies? A company yeah, company again, and- macking on the Showgirls the second time in a row, I guess. And Eric is like, oh, no, 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 oh, no. no. You're going to wrestle dressed as a Las Vegas showgirl. And Goldust, who is his opponent, is obviously is obviously like woohoo, uh, excellent, will do. And Regal is all like <laughs> Oh, we'll get to that. Yeah, <laughs> Regal immediately is, starts is his angry face. Gay panicking about having to do drag. I love I love this. I love the time period that we're in and how it felt about progressive ideas mm-hmm. oh boy great facial expressions from the regs though he yeah and we'll get to that in a second too i also want to I, I need to lay the groundwork for a later reaction of mine here because i was looking around the wheel and i saw a whole bunch of categories and i saw that there was a a, a broad panties match or whatever the fuck it's called yeah that's uh, it that's it and i thought to myself because i we we've seen this a little bit before with sable and luna vachon back in the attitude era and i kind of forgot about that and forgot what the rule set was and i saw that and my initial thought was oh interesting it'd be i i i get the weird feeling that we're gonna do this with dudes and make them wear bra and panties to fight that'd be funny and it feels like it'd be on brand for this childish ass era okay but then instead the drag thing ended up being this and i was just kind of like huh neat and very unwisely forgot about the bra and panties thing and oh boy it has a reckoning later but for now yeah uh yeah but if, uh, in the meantime, we go over to the blindfold match, and uh, well, first, well, first we get the trip, the Batista hype video. Oh yeah, oh, I forgot. oh flexes me. and screams and throws weights around. <laughs> yep, again, it just seems like Lesnar 1.0. Yeah. Anyway, then yes, the blindfold match. Triple yeah. H. Um. And shout out to like Austin pointed out, and, like I kind of realized this is the first time I've actually seen Triple H do his solo entrance on our show because all the other times I've seen him in ring uh, or seen him at all, it's either been him being middle management in the Summer of Punk or him being part of DJ X. So it was cool to actually see the one what's easily one of the most iconic ring entrances of all time i we saw michael cole do it a while right back, as a parody used me at the time because at, the, at that point i had never ever seen triple h's ring entrance and i didn't realize like that's what it was doing at first so right. but it was cool to finally see the real thing and yep it's a solid fucking entrance i know why everybody and their mom loves it now <laughs> Awesome water. miming along with the spit take. It's great. Yeah, anyway. And he wrestles D'Lo Brown. Yeah, of the Nation of Domination. Yeah, uh, I didn't know D-Lo he was on this episode. Take on a much more hip-hop persona here, which is yep. very typical, but okay, at least he's not doing the race war thing anymore. He's now a fun baby face. And yeah. we, we put on the blindfolds, and the early part of the match follows a lot of the stereotypes of a blindfold match. Mm. As in a whole lot of like wandering around trying to feel for each other. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it was so cool because it, I like, I knew that was going to be the thing, right? Of uh, they would stumble around and they'd try to find each other and it was going to be confusing for both of them. But what I really liked is at one point they do finally find each other, they do a little bit of a back and forth, and then Triple H gets a leg up, gets D'Lo in D'Lo Brown in the corner. And tries to do a move on him, but D'Lo kind of weasels out of it. Uh, he pulls something on him, and then D's, or D'Lo manages to get away. Triple H doesn't know he's gotten away somehow, even though I feel like Triple H should have felt that he had slipped away, but whatever. And so he's, like, pointing in the corner and taunting D'Lo or something. And then he goes to hit a move, and then just runs right the fuck into the corner of the ring and 
falls down. No, was, that was like, very funny. It was that was a legitimately really good moment. Triple H looked like a cartoon character in that moment, and I was super into it. And it actually made me really excited to see the rest of the match because I would love to see a match full of little shenanigans like that of, of them. Like, I I I love it when wrestling is able to mimic cartoon physics and this is this felt like one of those things and i wanted to see more of it and i was very disappointed to find out that that was kind of the extent of it yeah because after that the big focus of the match otherwise is that rick flair keeps trying to cheat and yeah. help rick, help triple h find where d is so lame. it's so it's so lame and I, like the fucking the fucking triple h cell actually IRL for real made me laugh, and then all the rest just does this lame stock shit. Come on, you will you will love to hear that this will be a defining characteristic of Triple H as world champion for the next two years. Wait, really? Triple H works his way to the top as one of the best wrestlers, and then for two years it's just Ric Flair helping him cheat. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Wait, the flame is shit. What the hell? Welcome to the reign of terror, David. This is the very beginning of that, but That's this is the reign of shit. terror. That's so fucking lame. <coughs> yes, it is. It is not well liked. Anyway, so what ends up happening is that is Triple H gets knocked down to the floor. He gets hit. He D'Lo hits him with uh, his his signature maneuver, and he's but he rolls to the end of the ring, and Ric Flair like whispers a, a, a plan in Triple H's ear, mm. and suddenly Ric Flair jumps in the ring and starts yelling at the referee and distracts the referee. So then Triple H pulls the blind the bag off of his head, so he can see D'Lo, and then he hits him with the pedigree, and then he puts the blindfold back on. And then Which, pins I don't know why the, the one, fuck two, that three. Wasn't a, why the fuck wasn't that a DQ? That should have been an instant DQ. Because <laughs> I guess Ric Flair didn't technically do anything. So. He fucking jumped the ref. <laughs> Yelling at the referee. Attack the ref. You know, attempting to attack the referee isn't a DQ. It's when you actually do it. Oh, fuck off. Anyway, Triple H wins. This is it was too short for my tastes and not yeah, enough interesting and, bits in it. Yeah. Oh, I'll get to that as we keep going. Yeah, I suppose it's not the only match tonight with that problem. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we get another Eric Bischoff skit. This time he is with Christian, Bubba Ray Dudley, and Jeff Hardy. And he's talking to him and he's explaining how nobody knows TLC quite like you guys. And for some context is that the first two TLC matches that have widespread critical acclaim were mm. between the, the Hardy boys, Jeff and Matt Hardy, the but the Dudley boys, Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley, and Edge and Christian. So they are the these are the innovators of this of this type of match. And all their tag partners are currently on SmackDown. So fuck off. You have to go find new partners tonight. Have fun, assholes. What the shit? Okay. But we the veterans of TLC's past are the one are filling out the match for tonight. I I God, what is it with WWE and splitting up tag teams across the stupid ass brand split? Come the fuck on. Yeah. It's a thing. Stupid. All right, okay. time for the Las Vegas Showgirls match. Oh, uh, yep, yep. Uh, Gold uh, Goldust is out here. He is he is all feathered up and he's Goldust very into it. It's living his best fucking life, and of course the crowd's weirded out by him because these dumb fucks are all like, "Ew, gay people, get this degeneracy off my screen!" And fuck you, I like my degeneracy where it is. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Goldust is out here living his fucking best life i'm here for it's legitimately wholesome it's making me happy my 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 initial note for this match is literally just wwf didn't fucking deserve dustin Rhodes, which is true that is an objectively true take and then regal pops out and of course he's being like forced out by security because he doesn't want to be seen dressed as a wom 
and he looks he absolutely got, horrified and scandalized and humiliated. Yeah, they they, they they made sure to like extra feminize him in comparison to Goldust. Yeah, well, they're probably gets, like, ah, Goldust is feminine already. Because yeah. he because he gets like the blood, he gets like the heavy makeup. Yeah, and he and he comes out wearing like ruby red heels. Yeah, that he and kicks off thing. mid entrance because he's like walking as if he's gonna roll his ankle at any moment. Oh my god, I was so I I was so stressed out watching him walk in those heels because he was just fucking and he was really fucking up on purpose. Nobody's that bad at walking in heels initially. Like like yeah, heels can be difficult to walk in, but as someone who has walked in heels for a show, n- no, it's fine. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's not that bad. Please call, please chill out i know it's done for effect but god damn mm-hmm. it's just like dude you're gonna roll your ankle please fucking stop yeah so he finally, uh, he finally kicks them off also well he also goes down a majority of the ramp with just one of them on it was oh it's so painful to watch but he's clearly horrified but here's the thing if dude wanted to he could fucking rock that look that that man could do drag rolls for days and i'd be i'd be he could. I, I william, think he'd be great at it william regal is a fantastic performer i think he'd be great yeah, no, seriously, I made this comment to Austin of, like, fuck, I need, like, I need, I need him to join, like, a UK tour, revival tour of Hairspray as Edna. Like, mm-hmm. he'd, he'd, he'd rock that shit. I feel like he'd be great stunt casting for that. Yeah, he would. Yeah. So, he ends up, he does get in the ring, and uh, the match barely happens. The match barely happens. Oh, man. Like, I, I can probably tell you both things that happen in this match is that yeah. we he, we get to the he he Goldust sets up for the his move in the middle of the ring in the in the corner where he kicks him in the balls mm-hmm. and he, Regal manages to avoid it and almost instantly out comes Lance Storm who is part of the Un-Americans with William Regal and he distracts Goldust while uh uh William Regal pulls out the brass knuckles from his bra <laughs> And he clocks Goldust in the face with the gold nut, with the with the with the nut with the brass knuckles, puts the puts the uh, brass knuckles back, and then he wins one two three. The fact that Regal is the one that fucking gets to win the drag queen match makes me legitimately kind of angry. Like, of course, of course, we can't give Goldust the dub in the. In, in the environment, in the in the match, aesthetic, whatever, in which he is clearly fucking thriving. Oh, no, we can't possibly reward that level of degeneracy with a duck. Like, fuck, even if you want to, like the idiots you are, heal it up all you want, fine. But Jesus Christ, this is gold dust element, and you still make him lose. Dustin Rhodes, why did you spend so much time letting this company make you your bitch or make you their bitch oh my god oh it's painful I, it's, it's just uh, uh, i don't like how they treat him and i will never like how they treat him i've hated it from day one from the moment you, you have it, and, it just keep, and it just keeps getting worse that's the thing there is no moment where it's where it's like cool it just keeps getting worse I suppose. Uh. We move on to the Christian inter- backstage interview with Terry Runnels. She's asking him about who his partner is going to be, and he's all hyping himself up that he is the he single handedly has won the first two TLC matches. It's not true, but okay. But in looking for a partner, in comes Chris Jericho, who suggests that, like, the only TLC match you didn't win, I won, which is true. He won the third TLC match with Chris Benoit as his partner. Hey. So this is correct. And so he they suggest he suggests that they should be tag partners. But as Christian, he has said that he refuses to tag with any of the other Un-Americans because he actually, uh, mm-mm, sorry. <coughs> Boy. Salute. He, is he wants to actually win the match. So he doesn't want to tag with any of the other un-Americans. <laughs> and so he tag teams with Chris Jericho for the TLC match in the main event. And 
Uh, I this interview really made me realize, like, fuck, they look so young in this. They are such babies. This they look twenty like such, years. They look, yeah, this, this is, is twenty just, years ago. Just about twenty years. Just just over twenty years ago, or just under twenty years ago, and like they look so young. Uh, it's it's man. I mean, I know twenty years is a lot of time, but it's so wild. Like just how how much different in a lot of ways they look nowadays like i fuck i see these guys on on dynamite and and rampage on the reg now and it's like fuck they were such babies it's so it's so wild to see like the origin stories here especially jericho at like the fucking inception of fozzy mm -hmm. oh, we, got, we got we got we got we gotta catch cat taz during some of these during this era of time oh shit we got taz around here oh man yeah brother we got Taz, yeah. but he's on SmackDown. Uh, so then we get a Eric Bischoff skit with Stacey Keebler and Trish Stratus, where first he says that the match, that their match has already been decided. He will not spin the wheel. It is, in fact, a blank on a pole match. We've had a couple of those on this show already, this podcast already. Mm -hmm. hanging on and he says that specifically the item that we will be hanging on the pole is a paddle mm -hmm. where the winner may smack may spank the loser with a paddle but eric bischoff is like vegas baby we're going double or nothing not the only time they try to shoehorn in those kind of gambling phrases on this episode. yeah and it makes no goddamn sense because it's just gonna be double in what case yeah, would be they, nothing. there would be nothing there is no nothing scenario so he spins the wheel again and wouldn't you know it it lands on bra and the panties match. bra and panties match and this is the moment where i man for as much as i've been talking about Chekhov's guns recently i did not see that one smoking mm -hmm. And so, and then, so Trish leaves, and then as Stacey leaves, Eric Bischoff slaps her on the ass, slaps her, slaps her on the ass, because of course he does. Workplace sexual harassment. Everything's fine. Not even, not even the only time that hap this kind of thing happens tonight. But let's nope. keep moving on. We get Bubba Ray Dudley walking into the locker room, and there's Tommy Dreamer sitting there, and he's like, Tommy. I want you in the in the in the TLC match. Nobody knows violence like you. And Tommy's like, yeah, sure, bro. But then Spike Dudley, uh, D Bubba Ray Dudley's kayfabe half brother, because I didn't explain the the origin of the Dudley boys on this podcast yet. But basically, their gimmick from the ECW days is that D that Big Daddy Dudley was a traveling salesman who had sex with a bunch of women on the road, and so he has a bunch of kids, and they have all. And they're all the half siblings have like come together as a family. And, and so Bubba Ray and Spike Dudley are half brothers. And Spike is like, I've seen you and my brother Devon, uh, you know, in these TLC matches. And I always wish that I could have been in one too. And then Bubba Ray's like, you know what, bro, you're right. Come on. I'm well, you, you'll be my tag partner tonight. Tommy Dreamer's just like cool, man. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fine, whatever. Mm -hmm. Sure, they find they find their tag partners. Things are set for the yeah. match, pretty much. Cool. And then uh, I wrote this down just because I wanted to make, emphasize that this hat. I can't believe this hat. Oh, I can believe it happened. But right before the bra and panties match, Stacy Keebler is walking down to the down the hallway. To oh the my ring. god! I know. She stops, is stopped by one of the production assistants who also tells her that her shoe while we, while, while he we is losing his mind. He's, being, he's losing his mind. He's being pervy as shit. <laughs> I want to suck in the face. I fucking hate him so much. So anyway, she is stopped by a production assistant who tells her that her shoe is untied, which it was, to be fair. I was like, so, oh, that's such a nice little... But oh. then she bends over to tie her shoe, and guess what? The production assistant stares at her ass. And oh, you got Jerry being like, oh, this guy's my hero! He's my hero! Oh. And I'm like, Jerry, oh, the, camera ang the camera angle doesn't allow you to see her ass from your from your vantage point. What? Shut up. <laughs> 
Oh, the little gremlin. I fucking hate it. Yeah, literally, I just have the note of shut the fuck up, Lawler. It's been too right. long since I've gotten to say that. Yes. But. Now we've reached Stacy Keebler versus <laughs> Trish Stratus in a bra and panties paddle on a pole match. Now, I it's believe the rules are that you win the match if you strip your opponent down to their bra and panties, and then the winner can then go grab the paddle and paddle their loser. I would just like to once again, Austin, return to the question that I, the the, the, the moral philosophical question I, I posed during Wrestleicious of the ethics of displaying and discussing softcore porn as part of this podcast. I still don't think it's on particularly strong ground, but hey, you're the one who does the planning. I, I just, I, I just, I, it raises some questions, you know, morally, ethically, philosophically, spiritually. Fine. I suppose I'll have to talk about this in the, as if this is a real wrestling match worth, worth talking about, to which I say it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's just someone's fetish material for a few minutes. No, uh. To live porn as we can get. Yeah. You know, they, they, they hit, they do some hits and some slaps. You know, Stacey Keebler is a very nice high kick, I will say. And eventually, Stacey takes, pulls uh, Trish's shirt off, and then Trish rips Stacey's shirt off. Uh, David points out that it's a tearaway shirt. Which yeah. Is ab- which, again, is absolutely terrible strategy. I mean, that just makes it easier to lose this match. Why would you wear a tearaway shirt? Uh, and then oh, uh, the match ends. So there's some more wrestling and tussling around. And then the match ends where Stacy tries to roll up Trish and yank her pants off that way. But Trish Stratus showing some real wrestling acumen reverses the count, the roll up and rolls Stacy up and rips her pants off. Ta-da! Trish is the winner. Yeah, okay, fine. And then and then uh Stacy Keebler uh high kicks Trish in the head and she grabs the paddle, but Trish is able to fight her off and then Trish gets the paddle and yes, she spanks Stacy a lot. Are you happy you sick fox? You you got to love the irony of the clear derision that every single person associated with this, both in company and in audience, holds the contempt they have for the degeneracy of gold dust daring to be flamboyant and vaguely coded gay, but we're all here for the con- total degeneracy of just satisfying every single straight dude's boner material live and in person on our show whoop de doo oh man oh my only man. two more my only two more notes are uh i did notice the guy in the front row who had his kid <laughs> with him and he like puts his kid up on the barricade with during this match to see better son it's important you see this <laughs> and then as i joked uh, Stacy losing this match really isn't going to help her win Babe of the Year. <laughs> it's not helping her case. Oh, uh, yep, yeah, that's what's important here. Who wins Babe of the Year? I mean, it's why she wanted the match. This is all. Yep. This is storytelling, David. Real, there, real story, there, real story-driven well, narratives here. I really, really even, narratively driven story. Uh, I TV shows. Suppose even porn has to have a plot sometimes. Anyway, after the match, out comes Victoria. And as I know, David, she Trish, Trish drops the paddle. Yeah. Like, could have used that as a weapon. We, but then yeah, they, we, they we start throwing the leverage away. Yeah. They start throwing hands, and Victoria kind of kicks Trish's ass. And we you got Charles Robinson, the referee, being like, hey, stop that. Go, go back. Yeah. Um, Bonus, just bonus match with Victoria, I guess. And we do see that this woman has some pretty good in ring uh, ability. She yeah, she has a sick moonsault. Fucking sick moonsault. I was impressed. And once again, ruthless aggression era clearly wasting its resources. I'm already deeply unshocked by this. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, then we move on to the backstage interview with Jeff Hardy and uh, Jonathan Coachman. And Jonathan Coachman's asking about who his partner will be tonight. And Jeff Hardy just kind of yells into the locker room and he's like, hey, dude, you want to do this? And Rob Van Dam walks out and he's like, TLC, yeah, bro, I'm in. Got a little stoner, man. Yep. So Jeff Hardy and Rob Van Dam are going to be partners later. Then we get the Victoria backstage interview. I forget with who. I think Coachman also as well, but I don't remember. And she's cutting this promo about how why she's doing all this to Trish Stratus. And it's not just about the championship. It's because if Trish Stratus is passed and how she is She's, she has a dark, it's a dark secrets and she's hurt people. She's hurt Victoria. And I was like, whoa, 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 man. We're doing the dark backstory bit with somebody else later. I'm going to need you to cut this out. This is, we're infringing on the main event. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it was whatever. Yeah, it was whatever. You know, it make vague accusations that Tristrash was a bad person in the past. I don't really care have nearly enough investment in the story to, to at all try to like comprehend what yeah so then we get uh, the next match test test this is a test against Al Snow because what does everybody want head, head apparently yes uh, that is Al Snow's calling card of, is, of a gimmick because he'd come out with a mannequin head and he'd be like, what does everybody want? And then they all yell head because innuendos are great. Real surprising that we're just giving all the credence to dudes who make the funniest sex jokes. I mean, it was the DX special, really. Yeah, yeah, you know what? That's fair. But it, come, come on. Give, give, give us something, anything to break the monotony. Well, I guess we do get that at the end of the show, finally. But anyway, anyway. I Anywho. also, also, mentioning Test, shout out to Test's name in the, like, title card on the the in-ring, you know, showing who he is before the match. Mm-hmm. Shout out to that making the title card look like it's just having a placeholder text. Just <laughs> someone forgot to edit it. Just Oof. test. Test. <laughs> and he, I'm, I'm, I'm far too amused by that. Mm-hmm. So Eric Bischoff on the video screen uh, does the spin of the wheel, and he makes jokes about T- Al Snow being tough enough because right now Al Snow is one of the coaches on the WWE reality show Tough Enough, where prospective future wrestlers are – go through challenges and training and shit and the winner gets a WWE contract. Whatever. It has produced zero good winners. Though some good wrestlers, for example, The Miz, uh, is probably the biggest name success story from Tough Enough, but he didn't win that that season. So, whatever. Well, hey, the origin stories. Origin stories everywhere, apparently, in this. Yeah. I I mean... I guess shout out to Vince's mission of we're looking for the next superstar is actually coming to pretty decent fruition here. Mm-hmm. Anywho, uh, he the, the 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 wheel has spun and it lands on a Las Vegas street fight. Yep. And apparently in Las Vegas, the streets are filled with trash cans. Yeah. Also, we're just not not doing the wheel spins in person with Bischoff anymore. I guess. Sure. No. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Guess we're breaking up the monotony of that if that is a bit. I don't know. Uh, look, I don't know. I found Smarmy Bischoff somewhat charming until he decided to sexually assault one of his workers. Actually, never mind. Fuck Smarmy Bischoff. <laughs> Anywho, Tess and Snow know the match is fine. Yeah, it's fun. I, 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 I've been spoiled. Like, I think mm-hmm. of a, a theme street fight and i think of the fucking street fight from full gear where they had some really site specific weapons of things that were things that were invented 
uh, mm -hmm. where we're performing. But here it's just trash cans, uh, chairs. Was that were chairs involved? No, they, no, they, they no, use trash like, cans. They use these giant dice. They use a cup a few giant different dice like, for si road signs. Oh yeah, they use the road sign for a hot second. Yeah, the, the most Vegasy thing we get is just like there's a large die that gets thrown around a couple times. Yeah, it's it was it's not even like the Halloween like the Halloween or like uh, the themed street fights of of holidays that yeah. have stupid garbage funny stuff in it. It's, it's kind of whatever. It's a lot of beating each other with trash cans. Yeah, pretty much. It was mostly a trash can fight. Yeah, it ends with Al Snow taking out a bowling bag that didn't just have a bowling ball in it. He also had a bowling shirt yeah. that he puts on and then he ends it, it. They have a little back and forth. So they get to that point, but eventually Al Snow straight up hits Tess in the face with the bowling ball. Yeah. Uh, also, I have to shout out your great quote during this match of Austin. Just one of them gets fucking thrown there thrown down with the to to the top rope between their legs and austin just beautifully wonderfully so sagely quips that this is the third match today with the with penis based offense yeah because uh the first match involved booker t kicking big show in the balls yeah you had uh gold dust attempting to kick william regal in the balls yeah here you have the land on the road crotch yourself on the ropes yeah, the again seems like another great trademark of this era. What goes along with the with the childishness that we've seen so far? Crotch shots. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, Al Snow Rip. gets the win. It's uh, whatever. It's whatever. Mm -hmm. Also, at this point, Lawler's getting re real excited, and he says something about his match. Yeah, his match. And I have to. I have to. I was confused by this because i was like jerry lawler is 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 on commentary what does he mean his match is this is a joke right or does he have some specific horse in this next proverbial think, race what's he I talking what, about I think, and, and i think what can and you go finish for, go for it no well, i will say what confused me is his continued insistence that he's going to be in an hla match well yes that too and i was like jerry you're not a lesbian he really want. I I wonder how that worked in his mind. Does he did he just think he was gonna like wrestle around two hot ladies in the middle of the ring fucking? Like I feel like that yes. would really take away from the viewing experience for you, Jerry. Like you wouldn't really be able to focus on the HLA. So what gives? It's, it's just two women making out in the middle of the ring, and Jerry Lawler just going ah ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, he doesn't even need to win. He'll just. Just uh, stand there getting thrown around just as long yeah. as he can, he can watch and squeal. But yeah, no, apparently Jerry Lawler gets to fight an actual match. Also, this is the part where I realized that Jerry Lawler, especially with like the sounds he's making, it's he's just Jimmy Hart, but horny and with a southern accent. And yeah, he's worse uh, off for it in a lot of ways. Very, very funny moment for me is list is he's on commentary. Like they cut to him and Jr. and he is just like screaming about how his match is going to be an HLA match or a kiss my ass match or something that mm -hmm. allows for him to be sexual. And Jim Ross just goes, "Well, what if it's an Inferno match? It could be an Inferno match, King." Mm -hmm. And Jerry Lawler just has this look on his face as if he has never considered that. Yeah, and it, an Inferno match. He does do a great little Looney Tunes double take at that one, mm -hmm. but yeah, he he's he apparently gets to fight and apparently yeah. is gonna get to have a shot at the the roulette, giving him some yep. good luck. Oh god! So he gets in the ring, and we come back from commercial with this, and he gets in the ring, and he is uh, doing, and he is. Uh, in the ring already, I believe, is um, is Stephen Richards as well, uh, who's yep. his opponent. And Eric Bischoff gets on the mic, gets on the, the video. He spins the wheel. 
and it lands in it's legal in Nevada. Now and, I, made a, again, I made a joke. To, I made a quip about that earlier when I saw it on the board earlier in the show. I well, uh, I saw it. I saw it on the board, and I was like, "Oh, that looks like a no holds barred match." I could, I could see that coming up mm. in in this episode. So it comes up, and I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay, no surprise there. No holds barred match." Uh, that's why it's legal. Like the joke is, everything is legal in Nevada. Ah. Oh no. Oh, no, 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 no. Everyone's asking, what does it mean by it's legal in Nevada? And then. Which, why would wow, they just infer wow, it's a normal wow. story? And then it goes, wow, 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 wow. The Godfather's music. <laughs> now we haven't had a chance to talk about this fine show. Yeah, Austin, Austin literally says, oh, man, I didn't think I would be talking about him this early. And that's already like warning, red flag. I was so oh. excited. Mm. Okay, so Godfather. You might also know him as Kama Mustafa from the Nation of Domination, or hey, if you're getting real. Hey, he's team. another refitted Nation of Domination expat. That's dope. Yes, also he was also Papa Shango in the in the early '90s. Mm. He was a voodoo doctor. Can't oh. tell. Anyway, now he is his most famous gimmick in the Attitude Era was, of course. The Godfather. The Godfather is a pimp. And he brings his hose to the ring every week and is like, we're going to get on board the ho train. <laughs> and, you know, it was funny earlier you said no, no, no to my, to my, my uh, retelling my, my theory that, that legal in Nevada just meant no holds barred because my note here is just no, 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 no. Yeah. I no, think, I think, I think no. for David Sandy, he might've blacked out during this match. So I guess I'm going to have, I wish I, I, wish I had, you know, that's a, next time I, next time I just need to bash my own head in. So I don't have to watch. Oh, David yeah. swore he was going to quit the show over what happens here. Oh, Thankfully, he didn't. Yep, luckily I don't have the balls for that. Excellent. Oh. So, the Godfather, obviously the joke is, what's legal in Nevada? Prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what the Godfather, he comes out with his hoe train. He's got like 12 of them. He's got a dozen. He's got at least a dozen of the hoes with him. It is, it is, it is, it is enough for one full train of hoes. It is a, link, it is a lengthy train of hoes. Is a, is a train of hoe a unit of measurement? <laughs> is it one of those things? Well, we're going to have, well, okay. I'm, we're going like to have to like a gaggle of geese, a train yeah. of hoes. Oh. Well, I think, I think if we watch more God, if we watch more Godfather matches, I think we can determine what is the average size of the hoe train, and thus what is one hoe train. <laughs> If you only have, if you have a diminished amount of hose, is it a caboose of hose? <laughs> and does that make him the conductor of the whole trip? <laughs> yes, he is, because he's the pimp. He's, and, uh, and, and Lawler looks Lawler like is a losing kid. his mind. Candy store, and I'm already angry, because why are we actually, unironically, IRL, rewarding Lawler's unchecked lust for for young hot ladies with their boobs out. Why are we giving him this? Fuck all of you. God. Yeah, I mean they're all too old for him. Ah! <laughs> Not wrong. Not anyway, wrong. Anyway, anyway, the win the Godfather explains that the winner of this match We'll get to ride, ride the whole train. train. I just, I, and uh, I, the fact that they gave Jerry Lawler that chance at all is disgusting and putrid. It makes me want to gouge my own eyes out. And then, of course, he wins. And then, of course. 
I said, I literally said, if Lawler wins, I'm quitting the show. I thought there was a chance, a slight chance. I kept thinking, I kept thinking, there's got to be some swerve to this, right? Like, we're not just going to play this straight. It's not just going to be oh, what no. the joke is. Like, I, like, I... It's so hard for me to wrap my head around this being taken at all seriously. Because, like, fuck, even in the worst we've seen of WWE, WWF thus far, all, all of this, like, horrible, ostentatious perviness is played at least a little bit as a joke. Like, they all, they always have a little bit of it. It's, we're, we're just Josh and Edge to it so i just kept thinking i couldn't wrap my head this was being taken full like i was like okay so lawler is jacking off under the commentator desk the the entire show as he does every week as he does every week in this era evidently and and is getting really hot and bothered for all of these ladies he got to have a nice little warm-up with the bra and panties match And he's been talking about how much he wants HLA and he gets a chance to ride the hoe train. And the stipulation is he has to win the match. There's got to be some punchline here. The the setup can't be that Jerry Lawler wants to fuck hot women and the punchline be Jerry Lawler gets to fuck hot. Like there's, there's gotta be, there's gotta be, (laughs) I was like, okay, I was like, okay, maybe he'll lose the match. No. No, I didn't. So he wins the match. Maybe the ladies are disgusted with him. No. no. They get up and, and I'm like, maybe someone crashes this. Maybe something they goes try to, They try to, the ladies try to anything. take his pants. I'm his desperately, off, I'm, no I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm over here just desperately trying to search for a swerve anywhere. And Austin is giggling like the fucking chaos gremlin that he is. Knowing that, that no, there is in fact no There's swerve nothing, coming, and swerve Jerry this. Lawler is going to go and spend the rest of this episode off-screen fucking prostitutes. God, fucking damn it! Oh, this I hate one. this. I hate this so much. Why are we actually letting Jerry Lawler fuck prostitutes? Fuck hot a whole a whole train. I was gonna say a, no, a whole train. Why are we why are we letting him do that? I don't understand why the fuck Jerry Lawler actually gets to go and unironically leave the episode to just straight up with no stipulations, no jokes, no anything. Go have sex with the hose of the whole train. Why? Why are we doing this? Why is this happening to me? Art is dead. Life is pain. Fuck all. All of you and everything. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, this is perfect. I, 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 this feels, this feels like a personal attack on me, Austin, because it's one of my biggest memes on this show, how much I fucking hate Jerry Lawler and how much I especially hate him when he's being creepy to hot women. And, 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 this, and, and this show's just like, yup, that's okay. But, this is a direct attack. Uh, you did. You did this on purpose. You knew. I didn't. I didn't you remember knew. this. Oh, how did you not? This is the fulfillment of this is the culmination of our biggest meme, and it's the bad ending. Austin, I was given the objectively bad ending here. Why? What? Gold, golden endings are for the golden endings are for new game plus only, pal. <laughs> Everything, everything here just turns out to be the worst thing. Every time I think something has potential. Like, I was talking about how I didn't hate this app. And, like, there was uh, there were things I enjoyed in this. But, dear God, like, on a whole, nine times out of ten, the thing just ended up being the worst decision, the worst thing you could have gone with. And, and we let J- Jerry Lawler, Jerry, shut the fuck up, Lawler, just unironically go sleep. With a train of hoes. I, I, I don't uh, even know what to say after that. Ab- absolutely incredible. I, really. I, I, I don't, I, no, I, I, and I don't. And this, 
isn't even what I picked this era for. We haven't even gotten there yet. Oh, this is just the warm up. Why? Why? why the warm up is the the hoe train is the warm up. Also, it, you know, you saying that reminded me there the the the, the, the phrase hoe train is thrown a, uh, around a lot in this episode uh, during and after this by by the pimp dude by lawler by jr and right. every time i hear somebody say ho train especially jr who just says it dead fuck like everybody says ho train without a hint of irony in the they say ho train like it's a yeah, normal I mean, thing just, i mean that i mean for the godfather that's just what he says so yeah that, that's that's but, just but, proper that, but when the jr involved, that's proper nomenclature jr is 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 also sharing in that nomenclature like it's no big deal and every time i just want to die a little inside every every time i hear the word the words ho train unironically spoken well anyway randy orton yeah yeah randy orton. Uh, we get we get a hype video for old randy orton we're showing some highlight videos of little baby face rookie randy orton you got his dad the cowboy bob being like, oh, I think my son in ten years is gonna be the great one of the greatest superstars of all time. I mean, he wasn't wrong, and Randy nah, Orton has a bowl cut. That's nice, I guess. By 2012, yeah, Randy Orton would be considered an all-time great by that point, I think. Yeah, well, there's first a little bit of prophecy there. You see, good and job there. we get a bit at the world in Times Square. For those of you who don't know, in the early 2000s, in, in, in yet another WWE outside venture that failed, they bought a bar and restaurant at, in Times Square, New York City. It was called, first it was called WWF New York, and then it was changed to the world, and then it closed after like two years. Uh. Because it was shitty few food, and a niche market that it was pandering to didn't work in Times Square. Anyway, they're at the world. Really, the only time worth going to the world slash WWF New York was during Monday Night Raw or SmackDown or a pay-per-view or whenever because they'd have actual wrestlers do cameo promos from those locate live on location during the show. Otherwise... Why bother showing up these place, this place for its overpriced Garbo food? Anyway, Randy Orton is at the world and he's signing some autographs. Cool beans. Cool. Cool. Yeah, people then, seem hype for it. Okay. Yeah. Then we get Kane in a backstage interview before his mat, before the main event. And uh, go Terry Runnels in, in their ongoing story where she's fucking Kane. Uh, emphasizing that he is indeed emphasis on the big red machine. Boy, she's fucking Kane. Yeah, remember how I mentioned that he macked on the backstage interviewer, Terry Runnels? Yeah, they're the actually fucking. They're actually. Wait, I thought they was just. He was just macking. I didn't think they were actually fucking. I think. I think. I think the implication that she's seen his large penis is in fact k proof that they have kayfabe fucked. Great. That's great. Okay. As, I mean, as I said, chicks dig the mask. Yeah, okay. Babyface Kane here is so boring in comparison homie, to Homie's just what saying he's all of he's saying all the the all the cliches. He says that his Canaanites are with him. The, the tonight. Set, you, can, you can do babyface Kane in a more interesting way. Like he's still a fucking devil, allegedly. You can do so much cool shit with that. We could have had like Deadpool tier Kane or something, something where he's like he's he's a you know crazy psycho badass, but he's he's a good guy now, and everyone loves. Like you could do, but they just they just made him boring and stock good guy. Why 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 is everything in this fucking era just wasted? But <gasps> we're an episode in, and I just already see how everything in every 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 single little thing every choice they made was just wasted potential heaped on wasted potential how can you be this fucking stupid 
Well, I consider myself a Canaanite. <laughs> well, I do too, but when he's a fun character, like when, when he's paired up with Dan uh, Daniel Bryan, he's a fun I, – I love Kane. I, I, you, I've, you've heard me talk about how much I love Kane. Mm-hmm. I love Kane even when he's being fun and silly and goofy. It's not when he's boring. Well, Kane is interrupted by Jonathan Coachman, who is like – Hey, Kane, I just saw in the back is a Triple H and Ric Flair beating up Hurricane. And so Kane, like, runs down the hallway and Triple H and Ric Flair kicking Hurricane's ass. They unmask him. How dare they unmask him? He is a superhero. You are revealing his secret identity as Gregory Helms of the world. No respect for the proud luchador tradition. I mean, superhero. Oh, this is, no, this is actually the proud superhero no, I, Yeah, yeah. Not I was, luchador. I was yes. Uh, and then... They break up the fight, and Kane shows up, and he yes, just yells, "You son of a bitch!" And, and that the gets a big pop for, that one, for yeah. some reason. I can't. Said, the word, the he worst, said the bad word. The worst part about all of this is that all the fucking marks in the audience are so bought into all of it. Why? Fun times, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, it was it was a different time. It was 2002. Mm-hmm. People had different sensibilities back then. Yeah, pretty much. They sure were stupid sensibilities. Uh, we move on to TLC4 uh, in the Fatal 4-Way match. Kane by himself and said he doesn't get a new partner. He just goes solo yeah. against Chris Jericho and Christian against... Bubba Ray and Spike Dudley against Rob Van Dam and Jeff Hardy. Yeah, it was it was a it was a pretty good match for the most part. I actually there they, they there were some really cool shots in it. Like the, I'll I'll give them that that they did they they used their TLC pretty much to its full potential uh, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I would say in in some ways even too much full potential. They had a about a zillion fucking different potential win teases and it kind of dragged on a bit too long in my opinion but Mm -hmm. man they made sure to go through every possible permutation of this shit yeah but you got there's a lot of fun spots you got the jeff hardy being uh, being a crazy asshole yeah pain is on a table and jeff hardy jumps from a ladder through the table to not yeah and that seemingly takes pain right the fuck out of commission that was wild Mm -hmm. you got you also had um, saying. You also had uh, two Kane. You had uh, um, Jeff Hardy h- held a steel chair in front of Kane's face, and Rob Van Dam jumped across the ring from one turnbuckle to the other to kick him in the face. Yeah, kick the chair in his face. That's pretty insane. Yeah, there's, no. There's just a lot of there's a lot of like really cool visual spots in this. Really. It, it's, it's, one, it's, 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 it's one of those things of like every once in a while WWE is able to kind of strike gold with it with a new idea and for a while actually do cool smart things that not totally run it the fuck into the mm-hmm. ground and this is one of those things like you you combine some of the staples of the craft tables ladders and chairs um and let some of your most daring most capable and most physically impressive superstars really go at it with these tools at their disposal and you just kind of let them do their work and yeah it's it makes it makes for a really great spot it's it's fun to have a lot of people in these matches and they did that part well the the eight man tag really solidified the the kind of daring desperate chaos that went on for a lot of this like I said, everyone got a chance to to try to go up the ladder and get knocked yeah. the fuck down about a zillion different times. It did take a little while for things other than ladders to be substantially introduced into the match. And I kind of thought that it was going to be mostly ladders and have it be kind of lame, leaving out a lot of tables mm-hmm. and chairs. But no, they, they find ways. They, they find ways toward the end. <clears throat> to incorporate more of that shit they got like three different table spots in it so quite quite a few fun chair shots so so to their credit they did in this one case take advantage of the the potential uh the the, the, the potential at their disposal mm-hmm. so kudos to that and it ends with uh why it's slightly wild but i guess decently predictable ending of 
after Kane is seemingly taken out of permission by getting uh, commissioned by getting pummeled through a table <coughs> by Jeff Hardy off the top of a ladder. He comes back toward the end and knocks, I think, Jericho off. Yeah, he 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 choke slams Chris Jericho off from the top of the ladder. And and climbs up to retain the belt. And it ultimately makes sense. Like Kane's the big beefy dude. His his partner just got knocked out, so he's angry and he has that spike to fuel him. And with some of the stuff they got coming up, it doesn't seem quite right to strip him of his of his tag team title yet, especially when he doesn't have a partner to right. use it with. So it, it, it makes sense that they let him retain for now, uh, yeah. get, considering the fluctuation that's going on. But, uh, but, oh, but who cares about any of that? Because yeah. after the match, Triple H walks out, and he's like, okay, okay. You say that this is the happiest you've ever been. Which one you did say- you say that? I think he said that in one of the backstage interviews in the last okay, few sure, weeks. Or that. But he's he's like, I I know your secret, Kane. I know about Katie Vick. Yeah, no, he's specifically like he he says it in this really clunky way of, but not all of us can be so happy all the time. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't remember how for he worked. For example, that. for example, I don't think Katie Vick is very happy. And and I'm watching this and watching the clunky way he's phrasing this, and if it, it's re it, this Austin, this reads like a parody. It's so goofy in the way it's presented. It it feels like it a is. joke in some way. And like fuck, this is their chance to do something actually grim dark, and of course they still make it sound goofy as shit with how it's presented. I think my favorite part is how, like, he pauses for emphasis in a way as if the audience should know what that mean what that means when he says that you, Katie Vick. Yeah. Even though this character only exists in the context of this particular storyline and no, and none others. Also, Katie Vick seems like such a fucking like random weird name for a big crazy story involving Kane. Hmm. Yeah, he continues on that you're like. Ten years ago, Kane, you murdered her. You're a murderer, Kane. And Kane just like stares, stands there and stares. And that's how this show Close ends. Close up on Kane's face. Waka waka. And uh, next great. next time we're gonna get all the details about that. Ooh, I'm so excited. I can't wait. In fact, I can, and I'd like to wait for an eternity if possible. Can't give you that. No, sorry. So that was the raw roulette. Uh, I think calling it a roulette is a is nice metaphor for the episode because just uh, you just kind of spins around and all sorts of lands on all sorts of stuff, some good and some bad. I put several bullets through my brain during this roulette, actually. And somehow, unfortunately, still did not get to mercifully taste the sweet release of death. So I guess we keep on trucking. Yeah, I think this was. I think this was a good uh, for an arc that is intended to kind of uh, highlight some of the worst of the ruthless aggression era. Yeah, I think this was a good episode for it. The word "good" is doing a lot of legwork in that sentence, buddy. Well, it's an entertaining episode for me. Yeah, because you like seeing me suffer. I do find that funny, yes. Uh, I will have my revenge one day. Will you, though? I'll find a way. Life uh, uh, finds a way. Finds a way, yeah, if you say so. Mm. Mm. But for next time... It is our it is our second annual Christmas episode. <laughs> okay. Hooray! Better times. And we are sticking to this general area, by the way, as we are watching the Christmas episode of Monday Night Raw from 2001. Yes, just fucking after the WCW merger. God, why can't we get away from this fucking company and its storyline? Because this is the easiest wrestling story to follow on the internet because they have Peacock. 
That's her. That's why I do WWE all the time. Anyway, yeah. So that is for our next episode. Should be a fun, festive episode. Yes, I do enjoy a good Christmas special. Okay, it'll be better. It'll be. Whew. Mm-hmm. Whew, we're going to have a fun time. It's Christmas. Holly jolly. Whew, deep breaths. Yep. Deep breaths. Until then, David, hit the plug. Yes, sir. All right. My friends, my dear, dear friends, thank you for once again joining us. For another episode of the Noobs and Knockouts podcast, we are so delighted to have you all join us once more. If you are a returning listener, viewer, what have you, thank you so, so very much for joining us once more. We hope you had a great time. We thank you for joining us week after week and hope you've had a great time all those weeks prior and hope you continue to have a great time with us in the weeks going forward. If you are a first-time listener, viewer, what have you, Thank you so much for welcoming us into your eyeballs, your eardrums, what have you. We here at the Noobs and Knockouts podcast like to think we are friendly to both noobs and knockouts alike. So whether you are brand new to the wrestling fandom and want to see what the hell this wild world's all about, or if you're a veteran and want to come here to see what the kids these days are talking about in wrestling discourse land, either way, we hope you we hope we hope you've enjoyed our time with us. We hope you would uh, continue to join us in the future. If you would like to keep having a great time with us and you're not entirely sure how to do so, well, not to worry, my friends, I have you covered. One, you can find us on YouTube. We are the Noobs and Knockouts Podcast on YouTube. Hit subscribe, ring that bell, make sure it turns a nice little solid color so you get notifications every single time we drop a brand new episode. Uh, come like, comment, uh, add us to your playlists, check out our playlists, we uh, we we have uh, all of our arcs that we follow organized into nice, neat little playlists that are nice and easy to follow. If you want to follow a specific arc all the way down or specific storyline era, whatever, you can find all that nice, neatly organized thanks to uh, Austin's wonderful efforts on there. Uh, or you can just jump around the, the old-fashioned way, whatever you want to do. Also, the added bonus of in recent episodes, you get to see our wonderful, beautiful faces up on screen as we talk about this stuff. Mm-hmm. See us gesticulating and making funny mouth movements and watch David almost rage quit in the middle of this taping, you know. Uh, Good times. It's, it's a great time. Uh, it's it's fun to add the, 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 the visual element to it regardless. So if you are a fan of that visual element or just have YouTube open conveniently, check us out. We are the Noobs and Knockouts pod- podcast on YouTube. There is also, of course, the audio-only experience that you can have with us as well. You can find the Noobs and Knockouts podcast on three of the best places to find your podcast, and that would be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, like us, rate us, review us, whatever the hell you do on there to to boost our metrics and say that, hey, these guys are pretty cool. More people should check them out. I don't know. I'm just saying either way. We love that sweet, sweet engagement. So check us out on there for that wonderful old audio only experience. The News and Knockouts podcast on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and on Google Podcasts. We are also on social media. There are a few places you can get in more direct contact with us. The first, of course, is our Twitter account. We are Noobs and Knox Pod, uh, at Noobs and Knox Pod on Twitter. I'm pointing to it on screen right now if you're watching on YouTube, at Noobs and Knox Pod on Twitter. Noobs, the letter N, Knox Pod on Twitter. Check us out there. We, we, we drop dank memes we engage with rest the wrestling discourse uh we just generally have some fun with the with the fandom on a on a whole on that site we post every single time we get in we drop a new episode so you guys know what the hell's going on all the time always <coughs> and of course the highlight of our twitter is the live tweeting of weekly wrestling watching mainly hosted by austin my friend what is on the docker coming up Right, as usual, we, uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern on TNT is AEW Dynamite, <clears throat> the oh, one boy. show, wrestling show I most consistently watch live every week. Uh, so if you want to see me have the absolute dumbest jokes possible and every single Dynamite, check that out but as well. We also have the uh, pay-per-views for WWE, AEW, and Impact Wrestling. Uh, upcoming for WWE is WWE Day 1. On January 1st, 2022. Uh, I will say that I will not be watching that one because that is the same day as the college football playoff. But I will go ahead and, you know, uh, pipe, uh, pitch that, uh, promote that anyway as happening if that is something that interests you. 
Uh, in addition, a Impact Wrestling's next pay per view is on January eighth, and it's hard to kill. Mm-hmm. Um, that is going to be a pretty sweet show. And then uh, next, and for AEW, their next pay per view is on March sixth. Just announced this week. It is Revolution. And so, uh, WWE Day 1, you can watch on Peacock. Uh, Please cycle back to what I said earlier about how to buy Peacock. And uh, Heart Impact, Hard to Kill, and Revolution are available on by traditional pay-per-view and um, online internet pay-per-view providers. Oh, hell yeah. All right, well, be sure to check that out. Uh, Austin's live tweeting is phenomenal. He's really funny, really insightful. Uh, drop some, drop some great content while watching. I can speak personally when I say he's some great company to watch wrestling with, even in a virtual only setting. So be sure to check that out. And Hey, sometimes I take the reins too. And I like to think I'm pretty okay at it too. So, but either way, no matter, no matter who's, no matter who's doing the live tweeting, come check it out. It's a great time. Check us out on Twitter at noobs and Knox pot. We also have a Gmail account. If you want to get in really direct contact with us, uh, we are uh, noobs and knockouts pod at gmail.com. That's noobs, the word, and this time knockouts pod at gmail.com. Uh, come say hi to us. Tell us what you think about the show, what you like, what you don't like, uh, what your favorite episodes are, your least favorite, whatever. Uh, any requests you have for future episodes, storylines, specials, general other wrestling media whatever we love to hear it uh what you know let, let the people speak we, we, we'll we're uh, we're entertainers that's what we're here for um uh or just you know just generally tell us that you really like hearing our lovely sexy voices week after week we would uh, we would certainly appreciate hearing that too uh but regardless of what you have to say uh if it, if it be uh praise for for how much you love this show or uh yelling at us for our hot hot takes week after week uh we love to hear it no matter what so come say hi to us we love to say hi back noobs and knockouts pod at gmail.com and finally we're also on patreon we are also the noobs and knockouts podcast on patreon one dollar a month gets you early access to episodes and a shout out at the end of each episode see y'all next time so luego <laughs>